Good morning, everyone. Why are you all smiling? <laughs> oh, it's Sabbath. Okay. Let's open with a little prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the rock and the foundation of all that we stand for and believe. And I pray that whatever transpires here today will be to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe, I have no idea what I'm going to tell you, okay? So bear with me. I believe that the character of God lies trodden in the dust of the highways of this world. And atheism and uh, the mindset of modern humanity is as it is because they have no concept anymore of the character of God. And why is that? Who has done such a great job in destroying the character of God out of the minds of men? Unfortunately, I have to admit that it is none other than the church. And I'm not blaming only one church. There are many to be blamed. Because God's character is being maligned no matter which church you belong to. Even in my own church, God's character is being trodden in the dust. Because there is so much confusion as to who God is and what he is. And there's this idea there's a God of the Old Testament and there's a God of the New Testament. And uh, as Richard Dawkins likes to put it, that the God of the Old Testament is the most miserable creature ever to have had the misfortune of being presented to humanity. And his sickly, sentimental, pleasant side, lovely Jesus, meek and mild, is no better because the contrast is just pathetic. So you try and reach someone like Richard Dawkins by going to him and saying to him, Richard, Jesus loves you. And see how far you get. <laughs> you get nothing but scorn. Now in my own life, it's exactly the same thing. My father actually wanted to be a Roman Catholic priest. He was a very staunch Roman Catholic, very staunch. He took me to Mass every single opportunity that he had, even if it was in the week at 6 o'clock in the morning, and every Sunday. And uh, the only thing that prevented him from becoming a priest was my mother. The attraction to my mother was obviously greater than the attraction to the priesthood. But my mother was a Lutheran, and she was a very staunch believer. She believed what she believed. And my father was torn between his Catholicism and his Lutheranism. And my mother was one of twins. And it just so happened that they both were getting married on the exact same day. Now they being Lutherans and her sister being a Lutheran and marrying a Lutheran, they were obviously going to be married in the Lutheran church. What to do if you're a Catholic? <laughs> what to do? What to do? And that was before 1962. There was no ecumenical movement where the Lutherans were just separated brethren. No, 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 no. They were damned to hell at that stage. And so my father made the compromise and got married in the Catholic Church, rushed out of the Catholic Church to the Lutheran Church and took part in a double wedding ceremony with my mother's twin sister. 
I think it caused major consternation in the Catholic Church because he never ever attended Mass again. Now to a Catholic, not to attend Mass is like a death sentence. And uh, I never know, knew why he'd never attended Mass again, being such a staunch Catholic. So he did everything possible to make sure that I at least would be a non-rebellious good Catholic. He wasn't very successful. But he never took part in Mass, ever again. I wonder whether he was banned from Mass. It's probably a possibility, maybe even a probability, I don't know. And I never found out. So this thing must have haunted him. And uh, I was in sermons with him where they had prescribed teachings. And they would rant and rave against the Protestant denomination. And in one of these, I remember it, I was a young child and my mother sometimes attended church with my father. And this pastor, this priest, he was a German priest in South Africa. And I even remember his name, but I won't, remember, I won't tell his name. And he was preaching against Lutheranism and against Protestantism. But he was finding it very hard because he, I think he liked my mother and she was sitting in the audience and he was actually crying. And I remember this because obviously he was being told to say these things and he said these things and my mother was very, very upset. And uh, I remember these things in my childhood. And then my mother got sick. She got very sick when I was eight years old. And she was diagnosed with cancer, and in those days they weren't very good at dealing with it. So she had radiation and they burnt her, and oh, she suffered tremendously. They told her she has about four months to live, and she managed to squeeze four years out of those four months. But the last year was a nightmare, a nightmare. And uh, that's where my journey actually started. Because I was in a Lutheran church, not, sorry, in a Lutheran school, in a Lutheran school, because that was the only school that was a German school in my country. So I attended a German school so that I would learn German, of course, because I came from a German background. And uh, fortunately, I was born in Africa, so I'm not a German German. I'm a German with a stamp which says, made in South Africa. There's a difference. <laughs> and uh, there I had special instruction because I was Catholic. I attended the Catholic group, which was given by a very zealous nun. And I remember her to this day in every detail. She's ingrained in my mind. I can see her. I can see her face. I can see her nuance. I can see everything about her. And I pity that poor nun today. But I hated her then. Because she was so convicted in her Catholicism that she was concerned for my mother's welfare and knew that my mother was dying. And so she was concerned that she wasn't Catholic and therefore was going to go to hell. And she wanted to use me as a tool to convince my mother to become Catholic before she died. And so she drilled me in this idea that my mother was going to go to hell and something needed to be done. She was going to roast forever and ever and ever and ever. And uh, what did that do to a young mind? What would that do to an eight, nine-year-old boy? Who would you start hating for the supposed suffering that was going to be inflicted? God. God was a tyrant. God was a monster. And so I hated God and I started to loathe God and I remember once she gave me a little bottle this size like a little perfume bottle and she said 
this is holy water from Lourdes. If you take this holy water home and you throw it onto your mother's breast, because she had breast cancer, then it might cure her. Now, I still hate God, but I'm clinging to any hope that there is, right? Now, I'm coming home with this little bottle, and my mother's lying in bed, and I've got this little bottle, and I'm trying to figure out how to throw this water on her without, you know, telling her that I'm doing this. I mean, this is, this is the way you grow up, with all of these funny ideas in your mind. Not as big as this bottle of water, much smaller. In any case, eventually I spoke to my mother and I was opening this little bottle behind my back and I was speaking to her and I coughed and oops, this water spilt on my mother and she says, what are you doing? And I said, I can't remember the rest of the conversation, but I remember doing this. What is it about ritual? What is it about all of these faiths and beliefs that we have in these animate things that we cling to those while we reject the deity that's supposed to be behind it. Isn't this what humanity is all about? It is so sad when you think about how humanity is. I can just picture Jesus standing there at the pool where the water is supposed to become turbulent when an angel stirs it. It was probably some volcanic activity or something or who knows what, some reaction and it went blub, 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 and they thought if they can only get into that water, things will be solved. I'm sure Jesus was standing with his back to the water and he said, uh, would you like to be healed? And the man said, I have no one. I have no one to put me into that water. All the tough guys get there first. I have no chance whatsoever. And we cling to these hopes of the silliness and when you read the Bible, you read, is there no God in Israel that you should cling to all of these things and cut out little pieces of, of bone and stick them to an altar and hope that your leg will heal or the sore will heal or whatever? And we think the Philistines were pathetic by making models of tumors and you walk into a an orthodox church and you find this exact same thing, little models of diseases and you think that this is going to cure it. God needs to be reminded, you know, he's very short of memory. He doesn't know that you are sick, you need to hold it there in front of him and say, hello, here is my model of my sickness, can you please cure me? And it's no better in Protestantism either today. So here I was with all of these mixed ideas in my head and I hated God, but I still believed in his, the stupidity of these funny little rituals. And then one day, I don't know exactly what happened, she was ranting and raving again and telling me about God and hell and uh, how unfortunate it was that my mother was going to fry forever and ever and ever. And I got so angry. I had the catechism book in my hand and I uh, tore it apart and I threw it at her. Not a nice thing to do if you're a little boy in a religious class. So I got thrown out. And I had to sit in the courtyard. And then the headmaster would walk by, who was a Protestant, and he would see me out there in the courtyard and he'd say, what are you doing out here? And I wasn't very diplomatic. I've never been very diplomatic. Gets me into big trouble. I said, that witch threw me out. <laughs> well, that modified my posterior. Because he took me into the office and modified it for me. Which didn't help me either, because now I resented him too. And this happened every religious class. And eventually the story got round about this rebellious person who is so anti this and anti that. He must be from the devil and the worst person on the planet. And so it spilled over to the Protestant classes. And I remember one particular teacher, he was the German teacher. Oh, bless these Germans. He said to me, fight, come here. 
And I walked to the front and he gave me one whack through the face without explaining why and said, get out, I don't need your kind in my class. So now I sat outside in the German class and I sat outside in the religious instruction class and I don't know how this headmaster caught me every single time outside, but he had a knack for it. And he'd say, what are you doing out here? <laughs> And I would find something nasty to say about that teacher, and then I would be modified. And so I became very rebellious. I hated school. I hated God. I hated religion. But I clung to the hope of ritual that something might happen. But it didn't happen. My mother did die, eventually. And uh, by the time I was 10, I was an atheist. Ten-year-old atheist. Didn't believe in God hated God, despised Him. But I had all the nuances and ideas of my Catholicism imprinted in my mind. Do you know the Jesuits say, give me a child unto his eighth year and I have him forever? That's how powerful the imprint is. They don't mind if you become this or that or the other. They'll get you back. They'll get you back. And history proves them often very right indeed. Do you know who makes the best Protestants in the world? Catholics. Catholics are the best Protestants in the world. Why? Because of the contrast. The contrast is so great. It's so enormous. You cannot fail to see it. The worst Protestants in the world are born Protestants. They have no idea what they have. They have no idea what gift they're sitting upon and they don't cherish it like they should. So I was an atheist from the age of 10 and a rebel and I hated schools and I did everything in my power to destroy schools. I was a vandal. I designed bombs to blow them up. I would have made a good terrorist. And I, would, uh, I loved science, and I got all the science books that I could get hold of. I had a whole library as a 12-year-old of science books. And I read science, and I read how to do this and how to do that, and I built a bomb, a massive bomb, and I put it into a, I still remember the casing, it was a baking soda tin. In those days, those tins were very sturdy, not like today, it was a sturdy thing with a lid. And I wired it down and I put all the components in. And I went from one chemist to the other and I bought the components. I don't want to tell you how to make a bomb, but you do need this and you do need that. And uh, you do need sulfur, for example. And The next one, I needed saltpeter, and I go to another chemist, and I need some peter. Why do you need this? My father needs it. What's he needed it for? It's for his stomach. <laughs> and that's how I got the components all together. And then I built this thing, and I dug this hole under this huge tree on one of the school grounds, and I put it underneath, and I lit the fuse and ran like crazy and sat and waited. And there was a massive explosion. And the whole tree lifted up out of the ground and fell onto the sports field. And being trained in deception by then, I ran like crazy towards the incident. Because I knew that if I run away from the incident, they will suspect me, right? So I was the first on the scene saying, good grief, what happened here? So this is how I was, and I was like that for most of my life. When my mother died, I got a stepmother. Now fairy tales are written for a reason, and I had a fairy tale stepmother. She loathed me with a passion. And so I was shipped off to hostels, and I lived in hostels, and my favorite hostel, of course, was the one at school where I escaped on numerous occasions, climbing down the drain pipes, tried to destroy it, 
Eventually, I ran away into the forest, and they had a search party for me, and I climbed into the trees and broke down the pine cones and threw the teachers with it. I was not very popular until they told me when I reached the, what do you call it these, I don't know what you call it here, when I reached about the ninth grade, they told me I was not school material. Obviously, I was not. And I had to leave school. I was expelled. It's no good that I carry on. Now, I had an uncle who was a headmaster at another school. So I went to my uncle and I said to my uncle, they say I may not go to school anymore. And being a rebel, if they say you're not allowed to go to school, what, is your, what are you going to say? Now I'm going to go to school, right? If they say I'm not supposed to go, I'm supposed to go. All right, I'm going to go to school. So I went to school. I asked him, can I come to your school? You're the headmaster. He said, no, <laughs> I don't think I could handle you. But I'll see what I can do. And so he got me into another school, a really prestigious school, one of the best schools in my country. And it was an English school, and it had a lot of Jewish children in it. Now, that was a recipe for disaster because I was German. <laughs> and in those days, that was a problem. And so, I decided I'm going to be nice and good, and I'm not going to blow up the school. I'm going to try and do what happens at school. And there was this one Jewish boy, and he kept on coming to me and saying to me, oh, you, you're a German. You're a Hitler fan. And this guy irritated me like crazy. But I ignored him. And every time he came past, you know, in those days, you didn't just go to school into your class. You had to stand in a row until the teacher came and opened the door, and then you went one by one according to size or whatever rule they had, you went in. It was very organized. And I stood there always and was against this wall, and this guy, I don't know what authority he had, but he kept walking past me, and every time he came past me, he would shoulder me. He would go, Gwah! and bump me into the wall. And I ignored him, and I ignored him, and he would tell me, I'm a Nazi, and this and that and the other. I didn't even know what a Nazi was, but never mind. I was one of them. And one day, I don't know what happened, but he hit me harder than normal, and I got hurt. And my fallen nature got the better of me. And I grabbed the poor guy, dragged him into the classroom, opened the desk, you know, they had those desks that opened like that where you kept your books in, shoved his head in there and closed it, not very softly, and modified his nose that it stood about over here. So I broke his nose. And that was it. I thought, okay, I'm dead. I'm out of this school too. I'm, I'm done with. And so the headmaster, and I remember him to this day, too. We called him Flipper because he had one leg that was funny. It used to flip around like this, so he walked like this. <laughs> Flipper. But he was, a, he was a very strange man. He always used to open the assembly with, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Quoting from the Bible, of course. And uh, he looked at us, and he must have had some information. And he said, so what is the situation here? And I didn't talk. This guy said that I had done this or that and the other. And then he said to this Jewish boy, he said to him, you know what, I think you need to go to a doctor or something, and you've been punished enough, you can go. Stand outside and wait till I'm done with this fellow. And then he said to me, loud, so the one outside could hear, so you think you can come to my school and act like a hooligan here, you will get your comings up. I should throw you out of the school for what you have done, but I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm going to give you the thrashing of your life, and you will never, ever, ever do this in my school again. Do you understand me? And then he got up, and he went to a cabinet where he had canes. And he took the one cane, and he came and he said, 
And he went to his chair and he whacked his chair six times, loud. And then he came to me and he whispered in my ear and he said, now when you go out, hold your back backside. <laughs> and he said to me, I know why you did it, because I understood what happened. But I will not tolerate your behavior and you will not do this ever again. Do you understand me? And I said, yes. And he said, now go. So I went out like this. <laughs> And everybody was happy. But it restored something in me which I had lost. Faith in people, faith in schoolmasters, faith in all of those things. And I became a normal scholar with good grades so that I could go to university. And that changed my life. That one incident, just one person that understands. Makes a big difference, would you agree? So when you see a rebellious boy, or you see a rebellious girl, even in church, how do you deal with them? You put them under censure, right? You better shape up or ship out, right? No. You must deal with them like God deals with us. So with this concept of God, I went into the world, went into the military, went to the university, became an evolutionist, and hated God like you cannot believe. And that's where I come from. And then, strange things happened in my life. I married a lady whose father was into occultism. Very deeply into occultism. And her brother became my best friend, and he introduced me to occult ideas and Scientology. How to clear, how to become a god in your own right. And I went into that sort of field and studied into that field a little bit, not too deeply. And then I married this, this lady, this nice girl, and then her father-in-law uh, came into my life, and he came to live with us, and he taught me so many things in the occult world. He wrote books on the occult world. So he was basically the first one to introduce the New Age movement into Africa, in its modern sense, with the Matraics and Blavatsky's writings and uh, uh, you know, all of those Lucifer Trust books. And I read many of these books. I didn't read the very deep philosophies. And he taught me many things. He taught me out-of-body experiences. And people think that these things are not real. They are real, but they are actually hypnotic. But they are so real. And they are dangerous to perform, because you can actually die doing them if you do not take care. And I, I was steeped into occultism. And then my life changed when our children were born. And when the youngest child was born, my father-in-law had been living with me, and all hell break, broke loose in my home. My child was constantly being harassed by spirit entities. I don't want to go into the details. I don't have time. You can look at it in my normal testimony where I go through what actually happened there. But it was horrendous. And I was being physically attacked by spirit entities choked, that you're fighting for your life. It's unbelievably real. So there was something there. I was an atheist, but an atheist doesn't believe nothing. He believes anything. So here I was in this dichotomy. And because things were going so haywire in my own home that I needed help to solve the problem. And this is where my Catholicism came back. Exorcism. Who can do an exorcism to get rid of the demonic activities in my home? A Catholic priest would, should be able to do that. And so I made an appointment with the Catholic Church. And I phoned the Catholic Church and I asked them 
about their exorcist, and they had an exorcist in Cape Town. So I made an appointment with the exorcist, and I went and drove there, and I met him in his office, and he was an elderly gentleman. Well, what is elderly? He must have been about two or three years older than I am now, young and sprightly. No, no, elderly. And he looked at me, and he said, you have a problem in your home. The devil is trying to kill your youngest child. Knock me over with a feather. I never told them anything. I just said I had a problem. How do you know? I said to him, how do you know? He says, the nuns told me. I said, excuse me, how could the nuns have told you? He said, in fact, I've been praying for you for a week. I said, that's impossible. I only just met you today. I only phoned yesterday. How can you have been praying for me for a week? He says, I've known that you were going to come, and I knew what your problem was, and your problem is so severe that only an exorcist mass in your home will be able to solve your problem. And I said, excuse me, what do you mean you know all this? How did the nuns tell you? He says, doesn't matter, it's the nuns that never see the world. I said, excuse me. And he said, you know what? To say that mass in your house, we need permission from the bishop. And I said to him, well, how long is that going to take? Takes out a letter signed by the bishop and says, I already have it. Because I went to ask the bishop, because I knew you were coming. A week before. Now, would that, would that rattle your cage? It certainly rattled mine. And then he came to my home, and I told him, excuse me, uh, you know, we don't really uh, believe anything anymore. I'm not really a practicing Catholic, and my wife is, uh, is Dutch Reformed. She's Protestant, and uh, she doesn't practice. I says, that doesn't matter. So he came to my home, and he did an exorcism. Amazing experience. Made this holy water, put signs on the, cr on the windows, and went around, and then all of a sudden, something grabbed him and threw him around the room. Have you ever experienced anything like that? This old man being thrown around a room by something that you can't see? Well, uh, your atheism very quickly disappears under those circumstances. And I, and I was thinking, that this, guy, this man's going to die in my house. And then recovered. Anyway, long story short, he left. <laughs> Problem gone. Well, how would you react? So I carried on with my normal life and I went to work and I taught my, my courses and uh, did whatever I did. But this little voice kept talking to me and saying, you know what, you're a hypocrite now. Now you're a hypocrite. You should actually acknowledge that the Catholic Church has the power to do all of this, so they must be from God. And you say there is no God, so what are you going to do now? So I contacted the local priest and I said to him, listen, I have a problem. I'm an evolutionist and I, I believe in evolution. And now I'm confronted with this idea that there might be a God, etc., etc., etc. How do you relate to evolution? He says, no problem, we accept it. It's the only way it came about. Okay. So I became a good Catholic again. Went to church, went to Mass, went to confession. Did all that a good Catholic has to do. But there was this battle in my mind, and there was peace in my home, and my wife said, you know what, maybe I should become a Catholic too now. We're all going to become Catholic. I said, okay. Know nothing, really, about the deeper teachings of Catholicism, it's all just the ritual. So I went back to church. And then that incident, you, maybe many of you have heard it. I know many of you might be even bored with the story, but it's a true story. Some people actually come to me and say, you can't tell these stories. You must change your testimony. Excuse me, how can I change my testimony? That's what happened to me, right? I can only say how it happened. So I'm in the medical class, first-year students, 400 students sitting in front of me, 
looks like this. And I'm teaching them the evolution of the kidney. From the nephridium in the simple organisms all the way to the human being. And this young girl gets up and says, excuse me, uh, <laughs> I don't believe a word you are saying. I believe God created this world. And this old animosity, this hatred, just boiled up. I mean, how dare a young girl affront and confront the professor in the front? How dare she ridicule what he's saying to this entire class? So I destroyed her to such an extent that she sat down and cried. Job well done carried on with my class, explained. And it's funny, some students will laugh, some students will be quiet, but that's what happened. Went back to my office, sat in my office, did my work, all riled up and angry. And the more I worked, the more this little voice said to me, you disgusting creature. How can you ridicule this poor young girl just for saying she believes God did it? You're disgusting. And what does a good Catholic do when he thinks he's done something disgusting? He has to go to confession. He's got to get it off his, off his chest, right? So I thought, okay, it's almost lunchtime. I'm going to drive past the Catholic church, go and get the Catholic priest and get rid of this burden. So I drove to the church. Get to the church. The Catholic priest is out shopping. I say to the nun who's there, I say to her, where is he? She says, shopping. I say, how long will it take? She says, she doesn't know. She doesn't know how long it's going to take. But wait for him in the church. He'll be by sooner or later. Now, you know, I've got things to do. I've got classes in the afternoon. I have a very short lunch break. Where's this priest? What's he doing? Shopping. I need to have my sin forgiven now, and the priest is shopping. That's very inconvenient. Did you know that? What happens if the priest is not there and I walk across the street and the bus hits me? Then I sit with a sin and I'm lost, right? I'm dependent on this priest. And so I'm sitting in the church and I'm getting angry with the priest because he's not there. It's my German nature, you must forgive me. My propensity to evil. So there I'm sitting and I'm looking at the little red light on the altar, and the little red light means that the consecrated host is there. Now, in Catholic thought, who's there then? Jesus, but it's his corpus Christi, it's his body. He's not alive, it's his sacrifice, he's dead. He's there, but he's God, and you can worship him. <sighs> so I'm looking at this little light, and I'm looking at this consecrated thing there, and I'm saying to myself, can't speak to you, you're dead. Where's the priest? I need to be forgiven and I don't have time. I need to have it done right now. And you can't do it. You're a corpse. You can't do it. Where's the priest? And the priest doesn't come. And these thoughts go through my mind and something starts clicking. You know, this is ridiculous. Why should I be dependent on a person who might not be available, and then I'm lost because that person is not there. Is there something wrong with that idea? Would you agree? Something wrong with it. Why can't I speak to God? Because I can't speak to him because I have to go through the priest, another priest. Ah. And eventually, I got so agitated, I said to myself, you know what? I'm done. This is not working for me. It doesn't make any sense. I think I was better off as an atheist. And then I made the biggest mistake of my life. I said, God, if you exist, show yourself to me. And I left. Whoa, what a mistake. Because he did. When I came home, I was my usual agitated self. It wasn't a good day. I did, I did not have a good day. And I forgot to tell you that when the problem stopped in our house, you get energy and we'd renovated the house and there'd been a carpenter who'd put a new kitchen in for me. 
And the, the carpenter was a Christian. And he said to me, when he came to install my kitchen, he said to me, I just want to tell you something. I don't only do kitchens. I also walk with God and I want to tell you about God. Can we have that conversation? I said, oh brother, not one of these nutty Christians. And I said to him, excuse me, I want a kitchen. You can keep your God, but I'll take your kitchen, okay? Whoa. So he left it and he gave me a pamphlet which irritated me and I threw it in a drawer and left. That was a year previous. A year previous. Now I'm getting home and I say to my wife, I'm looking for something. I can't remember what it was. And my wife says, it's in that cupboard, in that drawer. When you open the drawer on the right hand side, under that thing, that's where it is. That irritates me so about women I could scream. <laughs> they know where everything is. I know where nothing is. If I put a thing down there and she moves it one millimeter to the right, it's gone. <laughs> where is it? It's right in front of you. It's not where I put it. It's over there, but she'll know where everything is. Anyway, so I'm looking for this thing. And while I'm looking, I find this pamphlet. And for the first time in a year, I actually look at the pamphlet. And the pamphlet says, the Roman Catholic Church changed the commandments of God. That's all it says. Then it has the Bible version of the Ten Commandments, the Catholic version of the Ten Commandments, and the Lutheran version of the Ten Commandments on this piece of paper. That's all the pamphlet said. And I'm looking at this and I'm well, what the heck's going on here? How can they change the commandments? So I'm checking this and I say, this is rubbish. So I say to my wife, do we have a Bible? Because Catholics don't need a Bible. They have a catechism book, right? Do we have a Bible? No, we don't have a Bible. Now I'm, I'm irritated because we don't have a Bible. And I want to check this out. This is puzzling me. I forgot what I wanted to look for. I've lost it already. I didn't even find it. I only found this pamphlet. And then I remembered a box that an old lady had given me who was a paraplegic. And she left me her entire possessions, which happened to be old German magazines and a couple of books. And I thought to myself, you know, little old ladies that were paraplegics might have had a Bible. Maybe there's a Bible in that box. It had been on my shelf in the garage for, I don't know, five, six years. Took it down, dug through it. True enough, here was a Bible, a little German Lutheran Bible. So I took it, checked it out. True enough, commandments had been changed. Puzzled me. So I phoned the Catholic priest. And I said to the Catholic priest, can you explain to me why the commandments have been changed? He says, I don't know. I said, well, can you come to my house? Can we talk about this? So the Catholic priest came to my house. And I said to him, so what's happening over here? He says, I'm not into scripture. I said, excuse me, you're a priest and you're not into scripture? He says, no, I'm not into scripture. But I can send you someone who's perhaps into scripture. Are you interested? And I said, well, thank you very much. And off he went. And then this carpenter who I hadn't seen for a year, I phoned him and I said to him, excuse me, you gave me a pamphlet a year ago, can you come and explain this to me? And he came. And we sat that night and we went through the book of Daniel, through the book of Revelation, right through the night. And I was totally stunned. And I thought to myself, that's not true, this is nonsense, this can't be. So I went to the library of the university to check out the historic facts to see whether he was actually right about the history and Daniel 7 and all of those things. And I couldn't fault it, except there was a problem. It says, Sabbath day, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now what do I do with that? I'm an evolutionist. There's no way that God did that in six days. So I have a serious problem now. So I'm mulling this problem over in my mind. Six days, this is a lot of hogwash, this is nonsense. So I can't trust this Bible, this Bible is nonsense. 
And so I think, well, is there something about evolution that I don't know? And so I go to the library, and I'm standing there in the library, and I'm looking for a book. And uh, I'm taking out a book on paleontology. I want to s check out something that came to mind. And I find it, and I take the book, and a colleague says to me, Oh, the new edition has just arrived of that book. I just unpacked it. It's still on the back shelf. I said, okay, thank you. So I go to the back shelf, I take that book too, and I've got two books, old edition, new edition, and I take it to my office. And I start reading both books at the same time. I don't know why I did that, but I read chapter one. Okay, here's the old edition and the new edition. I want to find out what's different. Why is it new? What have they added? And I read there in the old edition, there are no intermediary fossils to be found to substantiate the change from this to that. No intermediary fossils. I go to the new one. It says, in scientific jargon, covers that up and explains it without denying what was said there before, but covered it up. Okay, I'll carry on reading. And it says, talks about whales. No intermediary fossils whatsoever. The new one says, these and these and these intermediaries. So I go and check out all those intermediaries, and every time I find that the old one is not lying, but the new one is covering something up. Uh, that didn't change me, because I was an evolutionist through and through, but it certainly did something to my mind. And then I was giving a course in genetics, also to the medical students, and to the postgrads, and uh, I was going through the genetics, and I started thinking about genetics. And there's a law in science which says that uh, natural selection takes place at the level of the phenotype. It cannot take place at the level of the genotype because there's nothing to select. It's like a book. A book is full of writing. And if this book explains to me how to build an aeroplane, I won't know whether that aeroplane flies very well until I what? Until I build it and try it out. So natural selection doesn't work at the level of the genotype. It doesn't work at the level of writing the book. It only works at the level of the product that is produced by the book. The question is, how does the product that is described in the book come into existence in the product in the first place? And then secondly, how do I test whether the product works? And how do I test whether it works better than something else if there isn't something else to compare it with? So there must be at least two sets of instructions to create at least two different things before natural selection can tell me which of the two will actually be successful. So the question is, how did the book come into existence? And the evolutionary answer to that is, it came about by chance. And you've probably heard the silly story that if a, a thousand monkeys keep typing away for millennia, eventually they will produce the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, in fact, they won't. They might produce the words that are in the Encyclopedia Britannica, but they'll never be in the right sequence to make out the Encyclopedia Britannica. So who wrote the book? Who wrote this book? And then the question is, natural selection is such a great God, it is responsible for all the improvements of the world, but it works by negation. You see, once you have selected the fit, the non-fit dies. So out of an option of two, the fit survives, the non-fit goes to extinct, from two, you've gone to what? To one. So my next question was, then how do I use a mechanism that makes less and less to make more and more? Mathematically, that is a major problem. And as I went through it, and I looked at the complexity of the genetic system, and all this stuff started boggling my mind, because at that stage in the scientific world, the whole mechanism of gene control was just being understood and how it works and how genes are activated and deactivated. Epigenetics wasn't even known yet. 
It came later. And once that is superimposed upon it, it is mind-boggling how complex a gene system is. And it came about by chance. Chance. And not just once, but millions and millions of times because you all consist of these plethora of genes. And who controls them? And why is it so accurate? This is design. And it started bothering me, and I started asking these questions. And then I had to give a class where all the professors also attend. And for some stupid reason, I decided to ask these questions. I had a list of ten. And I wrote them on the board. And I said nothing against evolution. Nothing. I just asked the postgraduate students, in front of all the staff members, how does this happen? Like I gave you the example of natural selection. How about this gene system that works like this? Or what about this irreducible complexity that you have, let's say, in the formation of the flagellum? The flagellum is that little structure that propels a cell forward, like a sperm cell has a, pr a propeller at the back, a flagellum, and it makes it go forward. And it's powered by a motor which is called a proton motor. And it has a very particular double ring structure where the protons move from one to the other and produce the movement in the sperm cell. And it is a motor that is so precise and so accurate and no Volkswagen has ever produced a motor that is so efficient that it is unbelievably complex and it has to be complete because one component missing in the motor doesn't work. And it has a forward gear and it has a reverse gear and it has different kinds of torque for different kinds of circumstances. It is the most complicated thing you can possibly imagine and if one component is gone, it doesn't work. So it couldn't have evolved incrementally to that point. It had to be complete and it had to work or it didn't exist. So natural selection had nothing to do with it because either it works or it doesn't. And it's far more complicated than anything that humanity has ever designed. Ask these questions. And there was deadly silence. I just asked questions. I never even gave the answers opposed the theory that evolution was not possible. And guess what happened? A young lady, man, what is it with these women? Gets up and says, in front of all that staff and all those students, when I came to this university, I was a believing Christian. And today, I am an atheist. Because what I've learned at this university, and she looked at the staff and she said, you have robbed me of my faith. And now I see I shouldn't have lost my faith. What do you think the reaction of the staff was? They were so furious. They were so furious that the one started foaming at the mouth. I remember a lecture I gave at the university Ah, one of the big universities in Cape Town. And I posed some of these ideas. And uh, there was a huge audience and all the paleontologists and the scientists were there. And they got so angry that one of those scientists walked up to me in front of all those students, came up onto the stage where I was standing and spat in my face. And I thought to myself, you know what? There's so much feeling here, so much animosity. What is this? And then somebody gave me a little booklet, a colleague of mine. In fact, it was the secretary. And she says, I want you to read this. 
Now, I told nobody that I had been in contact with people that keep the Sabbath. I told nobody. But she gives me this thing, and it's a book written against the Sabbath. Why the Sabbath should not be kept, the seventh-day Sabbath. So I, I paged through it. But I was so busy with my evolutionary thing now, I had no time for it, so I gave it to my wife. And my wife went through this booklet written against the Sabbath and came to me and said, I'm going to keep the Sabbath. <laughs> I said, excuse me, what did that booklet say? She says, well, I went through it and it gives you all the reasons why you shouldn't keep the Sabbath. Bishop so-and-so said this and this theologian said that and that theologian says this, that and the other. But none of them say what the Bible says. The Bible says the opposite, so this must be wrong. So she accepted the Sabbath, and now I'm in trouble. What am I going to do? I can't keep the Sabbath because I don't believe in six-day creation. It's ridiculous. It's a fairy tale. Well, I worked through that one and eventually did accept the Sabbath. And then I became what I am today, a Seventh-day Adventist. And the world says that we are a sect. We're a sectarian bunch of crazy people. And the first time I went to church, they invited us to lunch and I thought I was going to die. They didn't only look funny, they ate funny. Now that was a nightmare. Here are these funny people, they looked so different. And I remember I said to this guy, I will come to your church, but I will not change my attire. I will not wear a suit. I will not. I will come in jeans and t-shirts and sneakers. He said, that's okay. So I went there, and here were all these people looking like penguins. And I was in my jeans and my sneakers and I stood there in the back and I felt quite uncomfortable. But I thought, you know what, I'm not going to be a hypocrite to heck with you guys. I'm going to come like I am. And then things went from bad to worse at the university. My colleagues were absolutely furious at my change of, of thinking. And eventually I was at the point where I said, well, I can't continue this. I can't teach two things. So I resigned. And I thought, what am I going to do now? I'm going to be without a job. So I resigned, but they didn't want me to resign. I had many students that were studying under me. So the rector called me in. And the rector had a little conversation with me, and he said to me, why do you want to resign? And I told him, I can't, I can't teach a lie. I can't teach evolution anymore. I don't believe it anymore. And he said, well, can't you just teach it for the sake of the course and just keep your own opinions to yourself? And I said, no, then I'm a hypocrite. I can't be a hypocrite. Sorry. So then he said to me, well, who has the truth? And I said to him, well, I think the Bible is true. And he said, no, no, no. That's not what I asked you. Who do you think has the truth? Well, I don't want to tell him I joined a stupid sect, did I? <laughs> so I said, uh, well, I don't know. Those people up there who worship up there on the hill. And I mentioned the college. And he said, no, no, no. I want to know which denomination. And the sweat started coming onto my brow. And I said, <laughs> You know how we do that, right? We're so, we're so afraid to say we're Seventh-day Adventists. So finally, I said to him what I was, and he said nothing. He said, well, I wish you well in your future. So very sorry to lose you. Bye-bye. And off I went. No job, no nothing. Long story short, my life from then on was a nightmare. We lost everything. Lost our home, and Africa was, South Africa was going through the doldrums. I took a loan on something, on a farm, because I thought, well, I have all this animal knowledge, I can become a great, 
a cattle raiser or something or dairy farm or something like that. God has a sense of humor. And interest rates shot up from 5% to 36%. Nobody can pay 36%, so everybody went bankrupt, including me. And I paid for 15 years on something that I didn't own anymore. So it was quite a nightmare. But then God opened the door and a university needed my help. And they phoned me and said, would you come and teach the physiology course? Our teacher has gotten, our lecturer is sick. Could you come and do that for us for a year? And I said, yes, but you know what I believe in evolution? Don't believe in evolution. He says, you don't have to teach evolution. It's fine. Just your physiology. We want you for your physiology. I said, fine, I'll come. I was back in the university. Long story short, just a few years, three years, and I was professor and head of the department of a big university. The only professor in a secular university in the entire southern hemisphere that I know of who didn't believe in evolution. Can you imagine the trouble that you will experience when you do that? It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. The knives you get into your back. How dare you be, be the head of a zoology department in a secular university and not believe in evolution? And there were certain courses which required the teaching of evolution. And so I said to the staff, okay, which of you wants to present the evolution classes? And they presented the evolution classes. And they said, but you don't believe in evolution. I said, I don't mind. You can teach the evolution classes. Yes, but you would never allow us to bring in a lecturer from outside to give special classes on evolution. I said, get the best you can in the whole world. Come and let them teach evolution. And they did. They brought in big speakers from overseas and they taught the evolution classes. And when I gave my class, I always used to say, according to the theory of evolution, this and this and this and this happens. And students are not stupid, you know. They would say to me, why do you always say, according to the theory of evolution, every time you say something about evolution? Why don't you say, like the other people, this and this happened? Why do you say, according to the theory of evolution? I said, well, because I don't believe it. And they said, well, tell me what you believe. And I said, I can't. It's not part of the course. And I'm not going to waste the university's money by giving you my ideology in university time. But if you want to know what I believe, arrange a lecture after hours and I'll tell you. Do you think a student will pass that by? Never. It's like banning a speaker. <laughs> it's the best advertisement you could ever send. Get hordes of people who want to come and listen then. Best advertisement. And so, I would give a lecture after hours. And then the students would say in the evolution class, excuse me, that's not true, it's actually like this and this. It made me very popular. <laughs> and so I went in front of three tribunals. And I remember two of them very distinctly. The, the second one and the last one. That I was not fit to be the professor of a secular university. But God is so good, he's so clever. In all this turmoil, my research received such acclaim that I was granted the Royal Society London Grant for Reconstruction and Development in Southern Africa, the only biologist to receive that. I mean, that's a huge award. And how are you going to say that the man is an idiot if he gets this award from the Royal Society of London? It's, it's a dichotomy of thought. And so the letters go out, why does, this, why does this moron get it? I should be getting that, not this one. And this was going on. And so there were these tribunals. And I remember that one particular staff member really had his knife in for me. And he was a brilliant scientist. And uh, he got this tribunal together from other universities to try my case to see whether I could actually lead a university zoology department and not believe in evolution. Unbelievable stuff. 
And he had this list of witnesses. And I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what they were going to say. It was the strangest thing. And I was sitting in my office and I was, the tribunal had gathered over there in the, in the hall and he was in the office next door and I was saying, God, I don't know what they've got against me and I don't know what evidence they're going to bring and I, I can't defend myself because I don't know, so my only defense is you. So please, take care of this one. He comes out of his office, he's got his piece of paper in his hand, he walks down the passage, he comes to my secretary's office, he suddenly straightens up and he falls down like a brick, out like a light, with his piece of paper in his hand. There he's lying. We call the medics. The medics come. He's taken away in an ambulance. My accuser is gone. Only his piece of paper is left. That's it. So they take the piece of paper because these people had flown in from all over the country and now I'm on trial, but my accuser is gone. And we went through that trial and I said, no, it wasn't like that. It was like this. Oh, but can you prove it? And I said, I think so. Let's ask the students. So we phoned the other departments and we say, can you send the students from your class just over here for this tribunal? And then the tribunal asked them, is this ha what happened in the class? Is this what happened in the class? And they said, no, it didn't happen like that. It happened like this. And I was totally exonerated, and that was the end of it. But it's very nerve-wracking. And the next day, the man is at work. They found nothing wrong with him at the hospital. There was nothing wrong with him. He just fell over at the right time, at the right moment. And the third tribunal was, the accusation was, you cannot believe in God and be a scientist at the same time. That was an interesting one. And finally, they came to the Constitution, which says that you have freedom of religion and a right to believe what you believe. And so, they exonerated me from that one. But I handed in my resignation again. I said, well, I can't work with these colleagues because what's the point of working with them if they're going to stab you in the back every five minutes? And so they moved me, because my research was medical, to the Department of Medical Bioscience. And there I was, professor for four years, teaching medical students, medical bioscience, nutritional research, all of those things. And everything that I hated about the diet of this church was corroborated in my own scientific endeavors. I want to tell you, you're sitting on a treasure that you do not comprehend. You do not comprehend the treasure that you are sitting on. And we might be regarded as a sect in the world, but there's a God in heaven that has a message, and he wants that message to go out into the world. And the message that we have, believe it or not, we can find it in Psalm 71, where it says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Every time I have been brought before councils, whether they be secular councils at the university, God undertook even if someone has to drop down unconscious when he is about to testify. And God would turn the thing all the way around. Did I give myself a Royal Society grant? No. Why would I get it? The most unlikely candidate in the world. I have no, no thought about it other than a higher hand was dealing with those committees. The accusations that I had were so amazing. And when I was accused of these things and evolution, guess who came up for my support? You'll never guess. My Muslim students. My Muslim students. They would go onto the barricade for me, and believe me, they can go onto a barricade. Just look at the news. They would militantly support me. 
They would militantly support me. And God arranged circumstances. Unbelievable. South Africa experienced so many riots. That, and so much violence. You have no idea what the violence is like in my country. And there was a command that uh, all the students were not allowed to attend classes. There was a boycott. And if the students attended the classes, they would grab those students, they would pull the ladies out by their hair and kick them in the face so that they would destroy their faces. And they would take the men and they would take baseball bats and smash their knees. Very violent. And the university had said, we cannot tolerate this. We're going to carry on with the classes. And the students came to me and said, what do we do? Do we carry on with classes? I said, sure, carry on with classes. And they carried on with their classes. And my students were, I don't know who was taking the class. One of the, oh, I think it was one of my uh, great opponents was taking the class. But I'd given the instruction from, from the top, and I felt responsible. And here the rioters arrived, thousands of them. It's scary when you stand on that side of that, those rioters, because they come with these African rhythms, vroom, 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 and they go right through you. And I ran to go and try and prevent them from getting at my students. And there was a double door that the students had locked because they saw them coming and they were all sitting on the inside. And that door just has a latch. You know one of those double doors that you open like where and it has a little latch on the inside? And I went and stood on the outside of it and I said, whoa, you're not coming in here. And they all entered the building and the whole building was just full of faces. And they were aggressive. And they wanted to beat up the students. And the riot police came and the riots of police surrounded me. And they didn't lift a finger. They were standing there with their riot gear and their guns and they didn't lift a finger. They'd had instructions not to interfere. And those crowd, they told me to get out of the way. And I said, no, I'm not getting out of the way. I gave instructions that these students continue with the classes. If you want to get to those students to beat them up, you have to go through me. And I stood in front of that door. And then one of the workers came and helped me. And he stood with me. And there were the two of us standing at the door. And then they said, go forward. Push the door down. And they came and they crushed us against that door. me a second time, get out of the way. We refused. Seven times they came to crush us through the door. The door did not give way. It did not give way. Unbelievable. And then for no reason whatsoever, the lead guy was supposedly a student. Good grief, if that was a student, my name is Jack Spratt. He was some rioter or something that was appointed for this. You can check this out. It's in the newspaper. My picture even in the newspaper where they took pictures of this guy keeping the students out. Anyway, so this lead guy says, Mwah! and he turns around, and when he turns around, everybody turns around, and they left. And they went and destroyed the department next door. Nothing happened to my students. Guess what that bought me? It bought me four years of absolute peace because nobody dared to say anything against me because if they did the students would defend me four years of absolute peace until all those students had passed their curriculums and had gone out of the classes God uses strange ways to make sure that his message is not destroyed if we are prepared to speak the truth if we are prepared to stand for what we believe, God will vindicate you. He will take care of it. We are so ashamed of what we believe. I will tell you today, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I am a Protestant of Protestants. If I was, 
if Luther was alive today, I would be a Lutheran, but I'd keep the Sabbath. It says here, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. How many times have I had that experience? It's just unbelievable. I will hold a campaign, and the people will rush onto the stage to come and beat us up. You're very kind to me, you know. You haven't done that yet. <laughs> they will come and run up to beat us up. And the next thing happens, 200 policemen come and join the audience. My audience obviously wasn't big enough, right? And we do this lecture. Such wonderful experiences. My little Down syndrome boy, I'll never forget him, but that's another story. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when strength faileth. How many times have I been in front of my own tribunals, even within my own church, telling me, will you please shut up? You're causing problems. You're saying things that shouldn't be said. And what is this nonsense of all this occultism and stuff you're talking about? What has that got to do with salvation? Why don't you preach the love of Jesus and get on with it? And I say to them, well, try telling Richard Dawkins Jesus loves you and see what happens. You'll get a mouthful. You'll get a mouthful. It doesn't work. Why do people out there who have no idea as to why the chaos exists in the world not have the right to find out what is behind the scenes and what is happening? And the ones that will complain the most will be the Adventists. And the first thing I ask them when they say that to me, and I say, excuse me, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? And they say, yes, I am. And I said, well, then the message is not for you. So why are you complaining to me? It's not for you. It's for the people out there that need help. Why shouldn't Masons be able to hear what Masonry is all about so that they can make a decision? Is it unfair to go and call 36 Masons out of Oklahoma City and baptize them as Seventh-day Adventists? Is it wrong? Shouldn't they have the right to hear the truth as well? So how many, how many of you have, for example, looked at Total Onslaught? There's a whole lot of people. Some of you might think the man's totally crazy. But if I go throughout the world and I listen to the experiences, the one guy comes to me and he says, you know what, I had your DVDs on my shelf for years. I never looked at them. And then I had an accident and I broke my leg in about five or six places. And I was put in a plaster cast and I had to lie there for months with this leg up and I had nothing to do. And so I looked at those DVDs. And I'm in church. And then I go to another one and he says to me, you know what happened to me? I broke my leg in about five or six places and I stood there, and I had to sit, and I had nothing to do, and so I looked at those DVDs. And I go to another one, and he says, you know what happened to me? I broke my leg <laughs> at least ten times. I'm not joking. <laughs> so you guys better watch it if you don't want to break a leg. <laughs> or the one says to me, his 12-year-old son was watching the DVDs. 12-year-old son. And the voice on his computer or whatever it was, was driving them insane. They hated the voice. But eventually, the 12-year-old got them interested. And I can tell you story after story after story. And that's the only thing that keeps me going. When they say to me, you must stop. You must stop this. You cannot teach in this way. You must stop. And as one very prominent member, very high official, told me when I said, 
But people come into the church as a consequence. Don't they have the right to hear these messages? He says, we don't want that kind in the church. So I was very dejected, and I walked outside, and a young man comes to me. And he says, I've just discovered all of these things. And he tells me about his occult experiences and how this brought him out of occultism, and he says, thank you. So I have this contrast. We don't want him in the church. So I went to the next venue where I was, and there was a neuro surgeon a neurosurgeon and he said I watched these things and I was wondering what was happening in the world and I couldn't put these things together and thank you I've now also accepted this biblical truth and then there was a paleontologist and they're very hard to reach you know these paleontologists and he said you know what I watched that and this did that you know, God never leaves you with only the negative impression. He gives you the positive immediately thereafter to build you up again. So the one will knock you down, the next lot will pick you up. And then you're singing and dancing and you're carrying on with your work and you're doing whatever it is you feel that you must do. And we read on in Psalm 71. It says, My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the number thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Righteousness by faith is the message of this church. Righteousness by faith. And if we do not comprehend that, then we have missed the point entirely. In the next two lectures, we're going to talk about that. And I want to tell you that if you stand up for God, you will have your bad days and you will have your discouragement. Just go to Germany and try and preach in Germany and see how discouraged you become. I came home from Germany once and sat in my chair for three months, staring in front of me. And uh, if it weren't for my wife, I don't know. I mean, Martin Luther had the same thing. He was so discouraged. And he was just sitting there and staring. So I know what he feels like. I feel like Jeremiah. I will not mention thy name anymore. Cursed be the man that brought the tidings that I was born to my father. What's that poor guy had to do with it, right? I will not mention it. And then Jeremiah says, ah, but there was a fire in my heart and I could not relent and I preached again. We're all suckers for punishment. And Martin Luther, when he was sitting there in his chair and he didn't move and he didn't budge and he was depressed, his wife, bless her, she started wearing black clothes. Every day she wore a black dress and a black veil. And Martin Luther took a couple of weeks to recognize that his wife had gone crazy. And finally, he exploded and says, What the heck is this with your stupid black clothes that you wear every day? Why are you doing that? And his caretaker said to him, I'm in mourning. Why are you in mourning? Because of the death in the house. Who died? God died, she said. She said, he said, oh, rubbish, God isn't dead. And this, she said to him, but you act as though he's dead. <laughs> and Martin Luther realized where he was at, and he got up out of his chair. I had a dog. His name was Rudy. A magnificent dog. I loved that dog. He was a Rottweiler, a huge Rottweiler. And he had such a gentle nature. But I had two Rottweilers, and I couldn't keep them both. I had too small a territory. I had to give him away. I used to sit in my chair, and he'd stand in front of me, and I'd say to him, are you a little lap doggy? And he'd go, woof, boom, sit on top of me. <laughs> I loved this dog. And he had such a gentle nature. A Rottweiler with a gentle nature. And a guy with a restaurant took my dog. Uh, he had a, a fancy restaurant. And my dog went to dog heaven. He got steaks and, 
hamburger patties. And he was in dog heaven. And there he was lying under the tree. And a big Alsatian came by. And he, being a friendly Rottweiler, went up to the Alsatian and greeted him. <laughs> Turned round and walked away from the Alsatian. And the Alsatian tacked him from the back. And tore him to shreds. And he almost died. And then they took him to the vet and they sewed him up. And he lay under a tree. And he didn't come out from under that tree for three months. And every day they brought him his food and he would eat a little and drink a little. But he wouldn't get up from under that tree. He was the most miserable dog on the planet. And after three months, that Alsatian walked by. And Rudy got up, and he grabbed that Alsatian, and he shook the living daylights out of him, and he picked him up and threw him over a fence. And from that day on, <laughs> he was Rudy. Now, I've been there. I've been there. And we have a little saying in our house, when uh, things get tough out there, when's Rudy going to get up? Rudy's got to get up. There's a work to do. There's no time to stop now. Rudy's got to get up. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto I have declared thy wondrous works. And now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power in everyone that is to come. I've spoken enough. I just want to tell you one more thing. Do not be discouraged. Things are going to get tough. Do not be ashamed of what you believe. Stand for what you believe, though the heavens fall, and God will vindicate you. It's a promise. He will do it. God has never, ever let me down. Never. I've been before councils that you cannot imagine. I've been at the highest levels on the carpet. And I'm still here. And I'm still preaching. And by the grace of God, I will preach until I drop. Because I heard that there's no retirement in this business. There's no retirement. So, and I don't have time to get old. I don't know what it means to get old. I know I'm old, but I don't have time for it. I'm too busy. And that's what we should all be doing. Because we have a job to do. God's character is maligned in the world. He's misunderstood. That's why he's hated. When something goes wrong, what do they say? Oh, it's God to blame. I mean, you can just read the next psalm. It says there, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. This is Psalm 73. My step had well nigh slipped, for I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And there are no bands in their death, but the strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about the chain. Violence covers them as a, as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than your heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedness and speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walketh in the earth. And look at them. They're doing so great. And me, look at me. It's exactly what we're dealing with in the world. And people are saying, is there no God in heaven that he allows all of this misery to take place in the world? And God gets the blame for everything. Where's the devil? Doesn't he get the blame? They don't understand. And then there's that beautiful verse. And then I entered your sanctuary and I understood their end. If we don't have this hope of a God who records our lives in his sanctuary and covers us with his blood. If we don't understand that God, how are we going to represent him to the world? We should be foremost in representing the character of God. We should be the head, but we have become the tail 
because we are ashamed to say what we believe. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Not because Seventh-day Adventists are the greatest people on the planet, because this is a hospital, and it's full of sick people. Sick people from every walk of life. They've come in from the highways. They've come in from the byways. They've been prostitutes. They've been occultists. They've been the worst things on this planet. I've prepared God and I said I want a boxing ring when I get to heaven. And Paul and I are going to have a boxing match. Because he said, sinners of which he is the greatest. I want to fight that out with him. And if I knock him out, I get that title. If he knocks me out, then he can have that title. But I'm practicing. I'm going to knock him out. We are all sinners saved by grace. And we need to bring that picture of a God who respects us so much that he gives us freedom of choice, but is prepared to take the consequences for the bad choice we make so that God will be restored on his throne. May God bless you as we enter into the final phases of this earth's history and may make you strong and may make you courageous so that we can stand in the time that is ahead of us. Amen.